Hey, welcome everybody to episode number 11 of the Wonder and Awe podcast. I'm Louis Schwartzberg. I'm going to be your host. I know a lot of you know me from the films I make that celebrate life, making the invisible visible by taking viewers on journeys through time and scale, like my recent film, Fantastic Fungi. I always try to combine the how of science and the why of art. And I've always seen Wonder and Awe as that intersection between art and science. And this podcast really fills that sweet spot. Because what I've learned over many years of personal experience in filmmaking is that immersion in nature increases our capacity for courage, creativity, kindness, and compassion, which are the components we need in order to create a world for life to flourish. That's why I'm proud that today's podcast is supported by the Fetzer Institute. They're helping to build a spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer's new study, What Does Spirituality Mean to Us?, reveals how spirituality informs our understanding of ourselves and each other and inspires us to take action for the common good. You can explore these findings and more at spiritualitystudy.org. I'd like to invite you also to share your questions for our guests throughout the live broadcast. Please submit your question in the comments section of the live stream and let us know where you're from because the mycelial network is global. Our team will be reading them and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Environmental activism and education are core to helping people learn to appreciate the world we live in and to take much needed action to help save the planet. My guests today are environmental activists, Natalie Kelly and Juliana Furci, who are fighting a good fight to help protect fungi and spread the word about how and why the mycelium networks are so important to the health of our planet. Juliana Furci is the first female mycologist in Chile and, and the founder of the Fungi Foundation, the first NGO dedicated to protecting fungi. She's also the author of many books on mushrooms and a Harvard University associate. She also helped to get fungi recognized as an essential organism in Chilean environmental legislation so that developers have to take the natural systems into account before building on a site. She's also the co-chair of the IUCN Fungal Conservation Committee. My other guest is Peruvian Australian actress Natalie Kelly, who's the star of ABC's romantic comedy, The Baker and the Beauty and CW's Dynasty. She's also one of the world's leading activists promoting regenerative agriculture and indigenous lands and is a board member of the Fungi Foundation and Kiss the Ground. Today, I'm proud to welcome Natalie and, Juli and Juliana to the Wonder and Awe podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, thanks for having us, Louis. Thank you so much. It's so good to share with you globally because Juliana, you're in Chile yeah. and um, I think Natalie, you're in Ojai, right? Yes, yes, I'm in California. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I want to start off asking, where did this passion come from? Like, how did you start this work? And what inspired you to take on this giant effort? Um, well, thank you, um, Louis, and thank you, Natalie, for this amazing space. Um, there is no other explanation um, to my journey other than the fungi chose me. Um, I had very powerful encounters in the forest, um, working with different organisms, but it was when I encountered a fungus in, um, in a forest in Chiloé, which is an island of um, southern Chile, northern Patagonia, that I really felt this um, ineludible responsibility to work for them. So it's that they chose me, not that I chose them. That's beautiful. And Natalie, um, where does this passion and drive come from for you? Well, it comes from you, Louis. <laughs> you made a movie that changed my life forever. And so I have um, such a, a, a large debt of gratitude to you for, I love what you said in the beginning, making visible the invisible. 
you know, and I had had some uh, profound, beautiful encounters with various species of mushrooms growing up. Um, I remember being in the, um, Yaku is, is it the, it wasn't the Yakushima, a rainforest in Japan once. Mm a fungi on the tree was just speaking to me and I couldn't, I couldn't move. And I remember being so entranced by it and Fukushima had just happened. Oh, wow. and, and I was really like, it was my first time really communicating with, with, a, with a non-human species. And I was like talking to it, like, are you guys okay? You know, <laughs> what had happened was so intense. And they told me about their capacity to, to, to clean and to clean up and to, um yeah to be the the cleaners of of toxins and i said i felt this feeling of reassurance that they had got it and that was years ago and then i watched your movie and i was reminded again like oh yeah these guys are magical and um and so that's when that passion was reignited and through your movie i did some internet sleuthing and found juliana and said i just saw louis movie it's changed my life i'm a storyteller how can i be in service to the fungi and how can i help continue to tell the story because you opened the door but there's so much many more stories to tell and so um, i'm so honored to have been invited by juliana onto the board of the fungi foundation to help tell these stories and she's doing wonderful work that I can't wait to get into um, on this podcast. Right. I, I think the mycelial network has an intention because it's, it's brought all of us together. I can't tell you how many serendipitous encounters have occurred that are genius, especially in Hollywood, Natalie. It's, there's like a mycelium mafia <laughs> working underground, making these connections um, of people that want to you know, join the effort. Um, Juliana, in the movie, Fantastic Fungi, you said you're mushroom mad. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, it, that, that um, scene of that interview comes from um, your questions of what happened to me when I first met Paul Stamets. So I started working for the fungi in 1999. Mm -hmm. um, and in 2004, I, or 2005, I traveled to um, the Pacific Northwest to take Paul's professional co um, cultivation course for gourmet and medicinal mushrooms. And it had been a long journey until then, a very long journey. I was self-taught and I was you know, eager and, and, and starving for more information. And when I met Paul, um, and, and it has to be said, he was a heavy stutterer then when I met him. Uh, you know, so I, I am actually a witness to what what you show in the movie. Um, I, I just remember feeling there's somebody else, and it's all right to just be absolutely mushroom mad. And what mushroom mushroom mad is is really an ins. There's no way to separate every aspect of my life from the fungi. They are in everything I do. They're in every intention. And they're also in every unconscious um, happening all the time. We're not separate. Right. Well, they're everywhere. They're on every continent. The largest organism on the planet. Yeah. They're inside of you. They're under your feet. Um, yeah. But it's also it's also this, this, this um, very strong uh, force to work in service of them. Right. Yeah. So the the, fun, the Fungi Foundation has expeditions, education and conservation programs, and to develop also a, a deep respect for, for elders. Uh, Juliana, can you talk about the foundation's important work in terms of how people can help at home and get more involved to help the organization? Yes. Um, so really what the Fungi Foundation does is enable people to understand the, the wonder and the magic of the fungi. Um, some people refer to the fungi as a kingdom, others as a queendom. Um, but really, these organisms that include yeasts and molds and lichens and mushrooms and conchs um, are a gateway to uh, healing the earth and healing people we are a gateway for you to learn about that. Um, so you can find us in, on different platforms, the Fungi Foundation or Fundacion Fungi in Spanish. 
And um, through the material available, you can learn and you can learn to love fungi, to understand them and to respect them. And really that's the first step to help our mission, which is to help the fungi be recognized, understood and protected. And if you love that work, please, if you can support us um, through uh, every.org or through our webpage, ffungi.org. But really our role is to nourish you with the information you need to love them. Oh, that's so beautiful. As you know, with all the years of filming I've done, I've come up with my mantra, which is beauty and seduction are nature's tool for survival because we protect what we love. Wow. And that I believe is a, a truth that makes the world go round. You know, yes, it does. Um, so let's take a look at a little short clip I have of Juliana like foraging chili. OK, let's play that. Look at this beauty. It's a mitrilla or ostromitrilla. We're not sure. We've been finding it everywhere. We're not even sure it's described. My name's Juliana Furci. I am the executive director of Fundacion Fungi, or the Fungi Foundation. That's the only NGO that works exclusively on fungi in the world. We've managed to um, trigger the inclusion of fungi in Chilean environmental law at the highest legislative level. What that means is that if you want to do a large housing development, build a dam, build a highway, not only does Chile evaluate impacts on flora and fauna, but also on fungi. And we're the only country in the world that does that. It's one thing to describe and know the organism because of what it looks like, but it's another thing to know and to try to figure out how it's really working in the environment. What's its relationship to the other organisms there. And basically, without fungi, no bread, no beer, no wine, no cheese, no yogurt, no chocolate, no soy sauce, and no forest. Without forest, no oxygen, you know, no environment as we know it. So when we get back from the field, each collection is assigned a number. There's one person photographing, another person at the microscope, somebody writing the data into a computer. We also then proceed to dry the mushrooms. The drying is important because that's the way mushrooms are stored in fungariums. And that's what we do for hours after the field. It takes longer than it does to collect them. We believe that there's nothing cooler than fungi in the world. And anybody who doesn't know that will know it soon because of the work we're doing. Oh, that's so <laughs> incredible. I know people are loving it out there. Um, you know, one of the things I love, you know, watching that clip, Juliana, is, you know, this this idea of foraging. You know, a lot of times you go hiking up a trail, you don't see it, you come back to the same trail, you see it. The fact that they're hiding and, and it creates a sense of, of adventure and discovery. Um, you know, roaming through the forest, it's always like... Um, and it just brings out for me like that that magical moment of of artistry and and wonder, and and Natalie, I'm curious as an actress and a fungi activist, I wonder if there's a parallel between searching inside for the soul of a character that you're creating and exploring, and is there a parallel to like also like finding you know mushrooms in the forest? Can you describe that experience? Um. Well, I have to acknowledge here that I have not yet out been foraging with Juliana. And so I can, I've only um, amateurly foraged for chanterelles one time in, in British Columbia. And that was a fun experience. And what I learned from that is you need a lot of patience and you need a keen sense of investigation and wanting to go deeper. Um, these are, like you said, almost invisible. Some of them are beings, and you have to want to know how. You have to want to know how to penetrate the surface, and really, and really find them and get to know them, much like a character. And one of the things that I really want to do with the foundation, like you're making the invisible visible, is give a voice to the voiceless. 
and fungi has been so underrepresented like as as juliana said only chile recognizes them as a kingdom slash queendom um alongside animals and plants and 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 so that 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 itself shows you if only one country is recognizing this that the rest of the world has a lot of catching up to do in terms of recognizing their importance in the world and that's because they are such invisible hidden enigmatic creatures and so i'm like okay well how can i loan my voice and my big personality to give these little um organisms a voice and a, and, and and recognition in the world you know because their their stories are so promising for humanity you know even just what we've discovered Juliana what are the statistics of how many what's the percentage of fungi that has been discovered versus undiscovered so it's between five and ten percent of the earth's fungal diversity that's described so that's you that's what 90 yeah. percent that we don't know about think of all those stories we've still yet yeah. Hell. And if from that five to ten percent, we've gotten stories like penicillin, LSD. We know about um, what cordyceps and and lion's mane and reishi can do. Imagine all the other potential out there that we're not tapping. And so that's what's exciting to me. And I, yeah, I, I accept the challenge of investigator to go deeper, so that we can, you know, inspire, sporulate, as Juliana says, like what you've done with your movie. You sporulated me and <laughs> just. <laughs> go out there and that's what we're going to need is citizen scientists to go out there and really help us because with climate change we're really losing places like old growth forests which has the most diversity of, of fungi and so we need to be going out there now today there is a sense of urgency to this story we need to be we need to be really um no, understanding the importance of of identifying and 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 making sure that we can preserve fungal diversity now before it's too late. Yeah, I totally agree. And and, and Louis, if I may also tap into to your question. Um, in in my you know decades of of going out and and exploring places where nobody's ever been before to see what fungi there are, I've really come to accept the fact that there is a state of receptiveness that one has to have. It's an openness to an encounter. Every time you go to the forest, um, it, this is like maybe a painter. You start off with a blank canvas. And you think, you know, I want to paint a hand. And along the way, you know, this hand transforms. And maybe if you're open enough to listen to the inspiration, to, to the indications, to the, to every, um, every uh, strike of, of your, um, of your pen or, or whichever, you may come up maybe with a beautiful starfish. And what was meant to be a hand is something different. Yeah. When we go into a forest, if we're going into, for, into a forest, for example, set on looking for chanterelles, we may be missing a huge opportunity to encounter species we don't even know exist. And that state of receptiveness, which really is a spiritual state, yeah. It's an openness to an encounter. Mm -hmm. Scientists and artists should hopefully have that same openness to an encounter that leads you to discovery and creativity and, 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 and wonder and awe. Oh. Wow. Well, I love that. I mean, that's the essence of what these conversations have been about. I think mm -hmm. they asked you know, Albert Einstein like his definition of God, and he said it was a sense of wonder. And if you don't feel that your eyes are closed, you might as well be dead. <laughs> so I, I love what you just said. And I, I, I believe it's to be true that when children have that sense of wonder, they're experiencing everything for the first time. And to have this blank slate, you know, terra incognita, you know, like, what is it I'm looking at? How does it work? Why does it work? Yeah. You know, to be able to do that puts you in the present. And, and when you're in the present, that's really the, the goal of all meditative spiritual practices, right? Is to be in the moment. And, and it's so important also to teach children and people that you can color 
uh, drawing outside of the line. You can, you can walk and you can find something on a different path than the one you set out to. There is intuition is not to be suppressed. It is to be enhanced. And you can scribble outside of the line um, and it will still be beautiful. And that's what I love about fungi is that all these fungal discoveries were made when they weren't even looking for them. Like, they're, right, uh, Ju Juliana? Yeah. Like, you know, oftentimes there, there's been stories of like happy accidents, mm -hmm. like finding penicillin on the mold of a melon. And, mm -hmm. and, and we have to ask ourselves, are they accidents? But like, right. if if you if you set out like either as an artist or a scientist with a fixed mindset then you might not find like the magic that you know happens when like you said you get present and and open yourself uh to wonder and awe and seeing what will happen so yeah. i just love that like non-linear nature of fungi and how they like to reveal themselves to us in this these kooky non-linear ways so funny just just in the last few years i've discovered a new species to science which i got to name and a new um a discovery for chile on pea stops in the forest you know it's like oh give me one second i'm going behind a tree to and, and you find you know a new species and it's hilarious you know and and it's very common um among mycologists that you know when you go off to have a pea you find something amazing <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, most living organisms on the planet communicate chemically, right? And, you know, human beings have developed this thing called language where we speak to each other. But I, I feel that, you know, the mycelial network is using us to give them voice, you know, and to be able to, to be able to save the planet, to be quite honest. I mean, to, to have us like wake up and realize that it's all connected and that we need to live in harmony with the planet in order for all living species to survive. And I feel like the work that you're doing, the work that Paul Stamets has done, the, the our movie, you know, has helped sort of, like, you know, catalyze a movement that's out there. We're just speaking the, the truth. Right, the real truth, like the fact that there are these shared economies under the ground, not based on greed, where nutrients are shared for life to flourish, the mycelial network in the forest. And um, I can't think of anything greater to talk about than that. They're the coolest organisms on earth, Louis. There's no doubt about it. Um, yeah. They and really they're and well, they're also underground and they're rebellious, which yeah. fits with your personality as well. <laughs> we thrive in <laughs> chaos as well. Um, yeah, it's, um, it really, really, um, it's been an incredible journey. And, and I think it's, in, it's important um, always to tap back to nature. Um, the, the, going back to what you asked about being mushroom mad, uh, I started many years ago working for the fungi in a rebellious attitude uh, maybe not rebellious, maybe intrepid, um, but really this also speaks to the potential everybody has mm -hmm. to make change if you follow your beliefs. And if something doesn't exist, it doesn't mean it's not, it's not right. The fact that something doesn't exist only means that you have space to create. And it's important in the same line that we were talking before, you follow your instinct. You have, if you believe something is, go for it. That's what fungi really do teach. Yeah. You, know, you, can, you can move forward and anything can happen and you can make change and you can recycle and you can make medicine, you can make food, you can make leather. I, lo I love that inspiration. They're edge runners, right? Wow. They're experts at this like chemical warfare, whatever they encounter, I'll either yeah. eat you, I'll partner with you. Um, you know that 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 whole idea of being inventive, you know, at at any Perfect. moment in time. Yeah. Um, I, there's a great question that has come in from Arlene Weissman, and she's curious: like, can fungi help fight climate change? Is That's that a possible? Good can I take that one? That um, yes. I'm not waiting on you. <laughs> so, it's been proven um, beyond. Uh, reasonable doubt or really beyond a doubt that the the largest rate of carbon uptake 
in a boreal forest, which covers 8% of land's surface, um, happens in the mycorrhizae. So it's really where fungi and plants connect, where so fungi living on roots or in roots, that's where the highest rate known of carbon uptake occurs. So can fungi help fight climate change? That's what they do. Fungi are either recycling carbon, storing carbon, or fixing carbon. They're really the answer to, um, to the overload we're having of carbon in the atmosphere. There's no doubt. And I think the partnership they have with plants and trees, i.e. photosynthesis, right? Mm -hmm. They're the only, you know, living organisms that can, um, well, first of all, you know, take sunlight and turn it into chemical bonds and take the carbon yeah. out of the atmosphere and, you know, sequester it to, to, into the mycelial network. I mean, I think every breath we take is a symbiotic relationship with every green plant on uh, uh, on planet Earth, you yeah, know, but, we exhale but, CO two, and they give yeah. us oxygen. oxygen. What a beautiful partnership! It's amazing, and but what's really incredible, Louis, is that what new science is telling us is that the fixation of that carbon is happening in the symbi where fungi and roots touch, not through the leaves, not through the foliage of the trees. It's not through photosynthesis. It's through the mycorrhizal uh, biochemical uh, relationship. Hmm. Well, I got another great question here that came in. Do you think we can use mycelium to communicate with each other, much like plants and trees do? From Jake Erickson. Juliana. <laughs> um, I, I don't believe that communication is only verbal. Um, and therefore, my answer would be yes. We know that mycelium transports uh, electrical impulses. It transports water, transports energy. So uh, as energetic beings, um, I do believe it's plausible that we can communicate through the mycelium, but it wouldn't be verbal. I agree. Again, that's a very narrow, arrogant point of view to think that communication is only through spoken language, you know, uh, when everybody else really communicates differently. And the mushrooms speak to us in so many different ways. When, when you ingest it, you know, lion's mane for treating, you know, your, your nervous system, turkey tail helping with cancer, psilocybin for, you know, neurogenesis and opening up your consciousness, helping you to become more connected with the universe. I think these are all wonderful ways that they do speak to us which is really, really beautiful. Um, Natalie, I want to add, oh, go ahead, Natalie. I was going to say, and they help us speak to one another. And I think that's also one of their big purposes is to really teach us how to come into um, more, a more harmonious symbiosis with one another and the earth. I mean, that's one of their major lessons. That's like the, one of the biggest things that they are speaking to us right now is like, how do we get into a right relationship? One right. where there is reciprocity. That's I think one of their biggest lessons that they have to teach us is, is the, the, uh, is how to live reciprocally with one another. The way that Juliana was saying that the mycorrhizal fungi and the roots have a, this reciprocal beneficial relationship. How can we look to every aspect of our lives and ask ourselves like, okay, how do we show up in, and, and be of service and gratitude for all that we've received from everything, from the soil, from the fungi. And as humans, we've gotten on this We've really gotten on this wrong path of like what thinking like, okay, well, what can fungi do for me? What can nature right. do for me? And right. we need to stop to say, what are we going to do in return? Um, and that's something I think that fungi are really here to teach us. And some the way in which ancient cultures and traditional yeah. cultures used fungi was very much in that sense to really drop in to the understanding of the inter interconnectedness and, and oneness and our rightful place in the ecosystem. Absolutely. I th look, I think we need a new story. I mean, we're both have like one foot in the entertainment industry and I'm so done with survival of the fittest and kill or be killed. You know, we need survival of the kindest. And the films, 
that I've made like Fantastic Fungi and Wings of Life, which is about pollination where Meryl Streep tells the story of getting it on with bees, bats, hummingbirds and butterflies. That feminine side of nature is the story that we need now more than ever, I think, as a direction coming out of this pandemic. The idea of, of symbiosis, as you said, Natalie, relationships, cooperation, what, what the feminine brings in terms of regeneration, rebirth, nurturing. I mean, my God, that's what we need right now. And that will be the key to our survival. I'm there we go. We're done. <laughs> Those are the stakes. You know, will we survive or not? Yeah. It depends on yeah. whether or not we're going to start listening to the yeah. queen of fungi. And, and what I love is, it's, again, it's a metaphor. You know, it's like this is like nature's operating instructions, right? Three and a half billion years of R&D went into showing us how life works. And like, why can't we just like take a look at what's below our feet for a moment and go, this is, this is the model and it's not being preachy, which is why I think so many young people are becoming mycologists or diving into this because they get it. They get this idea that, you know, community networking, maybe because of the internet and all this new technology has evolved us into being more um, virtual in a sense, but this idea of networks. There's no such thing as life without networks, mm -hmm. right? And also, Louis, you know, it's so important. One thing that fungi can do um, is help us look back at how humanity has co-evolved culturally with um, fungi. Uh, so if we, for example, Nat, Nat was talking about penicillin, we all attribute penicillin to, you know, Alexander Fleming, or and we can talk about, you know, other um, modern modern day scientists. But for millennia, moldy bread was rubbed on wounds um, as, and used as an antibiotic, and that mold was uh, was penicillium. And if we look back, and, and this is going um, referring to your question before about our program on elders. Um, what we're doing at the foundation is really looking back to document and to discover and uncover uh, ancestral uses of fungi around the world. And it's incredible. You realize that there are um, species or um, genera of fungi that whose uses are common around large areas of the globe. I mean, this really is a cultural co-evolution of humanity with the fungi. And these are solutions, sometimes medicinal, that we're being, um, we're being charged at a pharmacy for, um, with, you know, for hundreds of dollars, when really that species found in nature is cosmopolitan and you can find it in your park. Right. So there are many important questions um, that can be answered or that can be brought up when looking at these ancestral relationships and capitalism, for example, and um, how and, and the right to medicine, the human right to medicine right. Um, from nature. So, so that's also an important part of our elders work is looking at what, what our ancestors uh, discovered with fungi, how they culturally co-evolved and trying to bring that back to modern day. That's so important. And Natalie, I know you, this is like a, a passion of, of yours as well, right? Working, well, yes. respecting indigenous culture. Yes, ancestral and indigenous uses of these medicines are so interesting. It ties really into um, another passion of mine, being an indigenous Peruvian woman. You know, when I asked my grandmother what her uh, experience with mushrooms was, she said, well, when we were po too poor to buy food, we would go down to the river and forage to eat. And, you know, that's just one way of the way, that's just one example of how mushrooms have helped humans. Right. Like get to where we are. They fed us. They nourished us. And and um, and and as, as as Juliana said, they were our medicines. They've been our 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 ways of communicating with source, with 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 our gods. They were they were our gods, you yeah. know. And if you and if you believe Terence McKenna, they're the reason why we evolved our prefrontal cortex, as you say, in 
in the movie, uh, something that really blows my mind. Like I really spend a lot of time thinking about our ancestors and, how, and their intimacy with this world and how we can get back to that place because we are so arrogant right now as modern humans with our technology to be ignoring the most ancient technology there is on this planet. I mean, fungi, mycelium are our sophisticated form of technology that's evolved over mil like millions and billions of years. And we're so arrogant to think that what we've discovered in this amount of time surpasses what they have learned. I mean, even before mushrooms were helping humans they were uh they were working with animals to control their bodies and minds and how like they're they're sophisticated manipulators and 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 problem solvers why are we not looking to the mycelium more for the solutions to today's problems yeah i agree it's like <laughs> this that that's why i you know again i I do a lot of time lapse, slow mo, micro, macro. Is that I want people to understand what is it like to see life from the point of view of a flower or a hummingbird, you know, or or a mushroom. It's yeah. like open, you know, get rid of those blinders for a beat. Be able to realize that every new perspective broadens your horizons and then opens your heart. And I think that's true also culturally. Like that's what's so beautiful about travel to be able to, to understand how different cultures live, whether it's in Europe or South America, wherever it might be, to, to, to slip in, you know, to stand in someone else's shoes for a moment and look at life from their point of view um, is a giant heart opener. And again, I think makes us uh, better people. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I know we're preaching to the choir, but the choir needs to sing in harmony at times, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, I think that is really, really important. Um, so, you know, um, I, I know that in a way this has an influence on your lifestyle. I mean, I know for me, um, I became, you know, I started doing a plant-based diet based and eating, you know, natural food, you know, back when I was in college, you know, and, um, I did it for a weird reason. Somebody came up to me when I was eating a hamburger and said I was eating a corpse and boom, like a light bulb went off in my brain. I said, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> but um, we also know that it's a giant, you know, contributor to, to climate change. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious, Natalie, um, what inspired you to become, you know, a vegetarian? To be honest, they were in, it was in environmental reasons. I had been told for years about the cruelty of the treatment of the animals, and I understood that like intellectually. But to be to be very honest, nothing really hit my limbic system until um, the fires in the Amazon, and then followed by the fires in Australia. And doing my research and learning that soil degradation due to modern agriculture and mostly cattle farming is 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 the main reason behind the fires and i was like i cannot be an environmentalist and still be eating beef and it started with that and then i slowly started eliminating all other animals just because i want i i like the the spiritual benefits of not ingesting the karma of an animal that has been killed unjustly and our food system is broken you know and so and uh, after eliminating um animals i realized that mushrooms were going to be a great source of minerals and vitamins and 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 proteins and iron and so i've really it, it's like I stopped eating this one thing that was not great for me and not great for the planet, but this whole new world opened of what I could be nourishing myself with. And just the feeling of knowing that what you're using to nourish yourself has nourished the earth is right. so, it, it changes your, your, your karma, I really believe. You know, we have a choice right now. You know, what we eat is really important. It has a, what we eat has a massive effect, probably the most effect on this planet. Sure. And so I'm excited about the untapped potential 
of mushrooms as food and food sovereignty, especially now when jobs in the economy are so uncertain. Why aren't we all growing, um, uh, growing edible mushrooms at home? What's stopping us? You know, and Julianne has some great ideas on this. <laughs> oh, it's. Um... I mean, mushrooms hold and, and fungi at large hold solutions um, that that the pandemic has helped more people understand. I mean, how many people have you know started their sourdough starters? Well, what you're doing there is is cultivating fungi because yeasts, as as many of us know, are fungi. Uh, molds are fungi. So when you're eating tempeh, what you're and, and you're you know you have your your um, your uh, go, uh, koji start goji starters. Um, it's it's a mold that you're um, har cultivating, um, and so many more. Um, really, it arguably um, fungi are the most important food source for humanity. Um, they were used. Yeasts were used to sterilize water um, in the form of, you know, different ferments in um, countries that had water problems. So the large, in the Middle East, you know, the evolution of humanity in the Middle East depends largely on this sterilized water source that was sterilized through fermentation. Um, and all the different foods everywhere on earth, every corner of earth depends on yeasts and other fungi um, as the basal um, feeding uh, step for humans. It's, it's, it's undoubted. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So especially I think in this pandemic, we need to be creative with solutions coming yeah. out of this. We don't want to go back to normal, you know, where we were polluting the planet, mm. 50 million children dying of starvation. You know, this wasn't a system that was working well. And I think that what you're saying is the mycelium could be the answer. On 60 Minutes last week, they had Bill Gates talking about how he invested in this company that's got little tiny microbes that makes protein on like a thin layer. And I think Anderson Cooper goes, well, are, is that mushrooms? He goes, no, it's fungi. <laughs> I mean, people got to learn the difference between the two, you know, the, that the mushroom is the fruit. Yeah. The mycelium is the organism. So, um, I mean, what what are your thoughts about being, what are the solutions coming out of this pandemic? Um, I think the solutions mainly center around self-sustainability, um, really coming into firsthand contact with how far away our food is, with how far away our medicine is, um, and also coming into contact with how close uh, the, the food and the medicine could be. Um, we have, if you have a small portion of soil, you have the ability to grow food. Um, from your waste, from that waste, from, from that food source, you can grow mushrooms. Um, and really, I think the most important lesson here is that um, it's, it's ridiculous to think that we depend on a supermarket to feed ourselves or our children. Um, I think this pandemic has taught many people um, what our grandparents and great grandparents already knew. Um, and it's that the, the soil and the land uh, is where food comes from, not the supermarket. And, and what about all the, like, you know, Ecovative and, you know, people are making, you know, um, styrofoam, uh, in packaging, you know, the burgers, um, building materials. Um. These, I think, Louis, I think, I mean, in, in terms of, of the previous question about what the pandemic has taught us, it, it's still far away, you know, packaging. and But, but you know, the new normal should be um, compostable packaging, um, non-animal-based uh, clothing materials. But this also leads us back to elders. Um, the Yanomami people in the Brazilian Amazon weave with um, the rhizomorph of Marasmius mushroom, uh, fungi. Uh, in Eastern Europe, um, the polypores were pounded to make suede or leather, which is, you know, Paul's infamous uh, hat. And some of us, you know, use handbags out of it. But this is ancestral use of fungi that has been brought 
to light by companies, but really using ancestral technology um, in a cultural co-evolution with fungi. Uh, the, the branding of it has been, you know, innovative. Uh, so, of course, you know, uh, Stella McCartney or Adidas using uh, mycelium uh, materials to make their, their clothes and branding it in, in those arenas is innovative. But the use of fungi for those materials is ancestral. Natalie, you, you've got this, tell us about this pledge about you made a pledge for a year not to buy new clothes. What was that about? Well, the fires also woke me up to a lot of reality. So I had to stop eating animals, especially beef. But then I also had to start looking at all my other choices in my life and how they were contributing to the warming of the planet. And one of the most polluting industries is fashion. And that is because to make these uh, virgin textiles, we are, for example, in the case of polyester and nylon, needing to extract that from fossil fuels. So we're literally making, wearing clothes made from drilled oil that is destroying our planet and warming our earth. Um, and so I just couldn't morally, once I knew that, continue as a, like, as business as usual, as an actress and fashion influencer, posting pictures for brands. I just couldn't, I couldn't in my conscience uh, tell people and, and encourage people to buy new clothes when the fashion industry and the constant churning out 70 billion garments a year we're making is one of the main reasons why our planet is warming and we're experiencing all these fires around the world. I mean, it's all interconnected. And so, one of my big things with the no new clothes is no virgin fabrics of anything that is harmful to the earth, you know, so no more like virgin poly, like when we shouldn't be making any new textiles from polyester and nylon, etc. cetera. Um, regeneratively farmed textiles is something that I'm very excited about. Like f before fossil fuels, before we were creating uh, textiles from from petroleum how are we clothing ourselves for millennia well as juliana said some tribes were weaving together the the, the micro the mycorrhizal what, what was it juliana the, my, the, the rhizomorphs the rhizomorphs of fungi okay right. for that but can you imagine using fungi to make clothes this is so exciting to me imagine being able to wear something and then when you were done with it putting it in your compost bin this is how we should be thinking. And yes, it's exciting that Adidas and Stella McCartney are uh, getting on the bandwagon. But what these what what these technologies uh, or potential technologies really need is more research and more funding. And so I'll use this opportunity again to say to people, if you've been inspired by some of these potential technologies and solutions that fungi could offer, please consider supporting something like the Fungi Foundation. Because when I first joined, what I said to Juliana was, why aren't we making clothes from fungi? Why aren't we replacing leather with fungi? It's just like, it's lacking the research and the funding. And so, if, yeah, we've all got to get excited about it and start envisioning these new, new futures where we're we're not burning fossil fuels to make clothes and then throwing them away and then burning those, you know, we're, we're, we're being more efficient and resourceful and creative with the way that we eat, clothe ourselves, create energy, et cetera. And that's something that I think fungi has a solution for. It's elevating consciousness, right? Like with all the choices we make, our food, our clothes, our transportation, um, and certainly what we haven't really talked about yet today is the fact that they can shift your consciousness. You know, the idea of psychedelics. And um, I mean, here in, in the United States, there's, you know, a lot going on. You know, we have so many cities now that have decriminalized, you know, psilocybin for medical use. Oregon, the whole state decriminalized it. And now with this Biden administration, um, Hawaii is pushing. There's a lot going on, I think, in terms of, you know, loosening the kind of draconian laws that go back to Richard Nixon, which we, we showed in our movie, how crazy that, you know, somebody made a mushroom illegal. Why? why the mushroom didn't do anything bad. <laughs> like, why is it illegal? Only because he was trying to, you know, um, fight his political enemies. 
you know, the, the women, people of color, the hippies, the anti-war movement. That was just a political move, like Trump has shown political moves using the Justice Department to hurt your enemies. So um, let's let's talk a little bit about that because I think that that is w another way that the mycelium is speaking to us. You know, it's interesting that um, if 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 people watching or listening and listening haven't read Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, they should do that as soon as possible. Yeah. And one of the interesting things in Merlin's book is, you know, this notion that maybe psilocybe, psilocybe species of uh, one group of the so-called magic mushrooms, although, of course, every mushroom is magic, um, really the, the, um, the move of the, these fungi and these mushrooms and mycelium around the world um, is almost analogous of the, the mushroom farming us or the fungus using us to propagate. Um, the power is undoubted. Um, once again, it's an ancestral use that has helped humanity um, evolve culturally. Um, and um, and also another one of these ancestral uses that could free us of the dependency on, on pharmaceuticals. And this is very important, very important. Um, it, mental health issues are way too uh, common at the moment, are way too frequent. Um, and it's driving debt. It's driving a, a series of side effects that are even unimaginable, um, it's driving uh, the sense still that being different is wrong. And I think that um, psychedelic uh, mushrooms and um, psychedelic compounds derived from mushrooms have the possibility to really bring us closer to health um, and bring us closer to the health of, na of nature, the nature of health. It's mm -hmm. the nature of health. You know, it's really ironic. Um, uh, next month, we're going to be doing a clinical trial here in Santa Monica at St. John's Hospital um, with the Pacific Neuroscience Institute. So it's to treat people with alcohol addiction, which is, you know, legal and billions of dollars is spent getting people to, to get drunk. And so... People are going to watch my imagery of the you know, rhythms and patterns of nature as they um, have a psilocybin, you know, session with a trained therapist to help them understand their self-destructive tendencies, which tends to be the root cause of, you know, any addiction, right? Alcohol addiction, smoking, etc. And it's amazing again if we're using a quote-unquote, you know, illegal according to the government, you know, substance to, to help people that are suffering on a massive scale. I mean, think of all the people that are dying from, you know, liver problems and car accidents, um, violence, you know, you name it, all from uh, the abusive use of, of alcohol. It's incredible. And also, if we, um, if we look at um, the use of of or the abuse of alcohol, I, I, I can't help but mention that fungi have been used in other ways also to try to combat um, the abuse of, of alcohol. And it's through uh, a compound that's synthesized from the coprinus mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So if you like foraging and you forage, um, we call them the ink caps, right? Commonly known as the ink caps. The ink, ink cap should never be um, consumed with alcohol because it has a natural compound that gives you, you know, just a, 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 um, a metabolical, you know, short circuit. And many of the um, medicines that use to treat alcoholism are derived from the compounds found in the coprinus, but they're only administered and made available in a way to make you dependent on purchasing that medicine. Whereas with psilocybin, for example, it's been proved that in most cases, one single experience will, will be enough to make your life better for yourself and for the people around you. So um, I think one of the most important things that psilocybin therapy is pushing is the notion that we really do not 
need to depend on um, perpetual use of, of pharmaceuticals to live well. And it's, it's right. important. Yeah, like the SSRIs, I mean, all they do is they, they numb you, you know, and you know, sometimes people are worried they're gonna have a bad trip. But the reality is I think that the, the, the psilocybin, they bioremediate your soul. They know how to go down deep and figure out what needs to be fixed. And a lot of times it's stuff that's been buried and stuff you don't want to deal with, right? And I love the fact that they they have that intention. And so, no, it's, it may not be a pleasurable experience for some people if they have trauma that they haven't dealt with. Um, I love that idea that just has how they bioremediate the soil. They can just go through every little cell in your body and, you know, do like a, a checkup and go, whoa, what needs to be fixed here, you know? And if there is buried trauma, then we need to look at that. Mm. I love that idea of bioremediating our soil. Wow, there are healers. And I really commend the people who are doing the work to decriminalize this medicine. It's criminal that we've criminalized this medicine that has helped our species over millennia. Yeah. And um, I, 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 I remember being profoundly impacted reading Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind mm -hmm. and him talking about the first wave of psychedelics and how our first, uh, it, the Western world's first introduction to psychedelics didn't go down so well. <laughs> with the rest of the public and how um, just the bad media image of hippies tripping on shrooms at Woodstock at just sent fear into the hearts of middle America and how, how long it's taken for us to just get psilocybin back, you know, cleared by the FDA for testing again. I'm really grateful to be in this place. And so we have this incredible opportunity now in front right. of us. And that's why I really also want to commend you on, how you portrayed psilocybin in your movie, Fantastic Fungi, because you showing real people, somebody's dad, somebody's father, somebody's grandmother, taking psilocybin and having a profoundly healing experience, helping them combat depression or anxiety about the end of their life. You know, this is, these are the stories we need to tell. This is not just a recreational, you know, um, a recreational drug. This is a, a healing medicine and we need to treat it in that way. And um, and yeah, I was profoundly impacted by Michael Pollan saying that psychedelics are gonna need ambassadors now, you know, like really credible ambassadors because now the next step is to reach the public. I have a funny little anecdote. I have to be careful how I say this for privacy. I had a man who was in his 60s, a Texan Republican, <laughs> tell me, I read about people microdosing on psilocybin and I really want to give up alcohol and I want to give this a try. And I thought, wow, <laughs> we're getting somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a fast track to elevating consciousness on a massive scale. And so, and that's why we've got to be really careful about it. And that's why as a young person who has used psilocybin recreationally in the past, I'm looking at myself now like, okay, wow, I want to be one of these ambassadors. And so how can we encourage more training? I think there's got to be a lot, a lot of reverence. We need to go back to ancestrally, you know, like I personally want a pilgrimage to Wautla. I know that a lot of people do that, but that's where Maria Sabine is from. And I'm not trying to blow the place up. And I know that the locals there are probably tired of the gringos coming down wanting answers. But I I, I, I want to, I, 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 if I'm going to be an ambassador of this healing medicine, I want to know how our ancestors did it and bring back their, 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 um, their ways and their, and their rituals and their ceremonies so that we can elevate her back to her back put her back on her altar yeah and that's so beautiful Matt and um, you are an ambassador um so it's not that you want to be you are um what I, I would like to say two things about this one is that um it's important for people to know that um psilocybin 
Oh, and psilocybe isn't the only uh, jet group of, of fungi that um, can heal the soul, um, the mind and the spirit and or the body. There are, there are, there's a huge potential. As we've been saying um, over and over again, this is a kingdom or slash queendom of organisms. Um, and, and there are uh, many species in different parts of the world that have co-evolved culturally with humanity. Um, and, and we're only just starting to scratch the surface of those uses. And the other thing I'd like to say is that I think it's, it's fundamental to keep the use even of synthesized um, psilocybin in the space of sanctity. Um, and at the same time, not be afraid to purge. If we look at powerful medicines um, in nature, be them from plants like ayahuasca, which, you know, two plants, be it cambo from an animal, no, from an amphibian, uh, be it from psilocybin, a psilocybe from, from a, a mushroom. What we refer to as a bad trip many times is the process of purging, purgar, we say in Spanish. It's part of the healing process. <laughs> healing is not easy. And we've been led to think that it's as easy as taking a pill every day at the same time, and it's done. But it's not. It has to do with consciousness. It has to do with bringing the unconscious to the consciousness. And it has to be a, a, a process done in the light not done in negation of what's happening, depending on a synthesized pill. And it's important to, to keep that and, and to embrace even a bad trip. Especially as pharmaceutical companies start eyeing psilocybin, we have to really make sure that we're standing up and we're warriors for, like Juliana said, the sanctity of the plant and not let this get in the hands. This is a very precarious time you know people are looking to synthesize synthesize it and market it and make money off it and we cannot let this turn into another capitalist commodity but what i love about what i read about some of these tests trying to synthesize psilocybin is that it doesn't work when you separate it like it needs the entourage effect of eating the plant the fungi is too smart they're like you're not gonna get us as a pharmaceutical industry, but it's still really important that we, we we become aware and stay advocating and really fighting on the side, like Juliana said, of the sanctity of the of the plant. And the mushroom. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Thank you of the mushroom. Sorry, I lost my train of thought because I, I there was something else that I wanted to say that was um that it de it was it decomposes our trauma. How amazing. Right they are these decomposers and that they're coming in and it's, sometimes that's uncomfortable and we have to we have to get comfortable with the process of decomposition because I actually think that's what's happening in the earth right now yeah. we're going through this death cycle in, and we're going to need the fungi to help us decompose it so that new life can grow out of it yeah and as a mantra um, I think a useful one for many people is that it's not rock and roll anymore it's rotten mold <laughs> not rock and roll, not rock and roll. We've got to embrace the rot. Let it rot. Amazing. Well, I think that's a beautiful way for us. I think to uh, conclude this, like really, you know, spiritual talk, um, and give us, I think, the inspiration of what we need to do to go forward. Um, again, you know, decomposition is not the end of life. It could be the beginning of life. We're going through this incredible period right now of breakdown and breakthrough, right? For something to be rebuilt, you need the component parts. And that's what um, the mycelium do, right? You, the plants can't grow without the, the nitrogen, the carbon, all the little elements. It's the beginning of life because life's a circle. It all depends on your perspective, whether it's the end or whether it's the beginning. And I hope this is the beginning for us and for everybody that's listening or watching this, you know, podcast to focus on what they can do in their own lives. I mean, you have the most incredible power on the planet. It's the power to choose and choose wisely. So thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Juliana, for all that you do, for being, you know, mushroom mad and eco warriors, respecting elders 
Um, I know you're an inspiration for, for so many people. Thank you so much for joining me on this you know, little um, excursion, a journey. And I also want to be able to thank again, you know, the Fetzer Institute for helping to sponsor this program, our podcast, the work they do to build a spiritual foundation for a loving world. I'd like to also thank our producer, Sean and Leland, Annie, Courtney and Sarah from Moving Art, Bethany, Ron and Diana from Magical Threads. Um, it's going to take a village. It's going to take a global effort to um, shift our direction. And um, we're blessed to have been born in this time and space to be able to be here. That is not a coincidence. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Matt.